that good? You're good to go, sir. Okay. We have their own I do. We just got information of a possible downed aircraft uh, in the vicinity of Petersburg. All we have right now is a position from the locating beacon that the uh, aircraft has. Uh, we also know that there were seven people on board. Our aircraft is equipped with receivers that can pick up the 406 beacon. So on this case, we're going to actively be monitoring those frequencies to make sure that we can pick up that transponder and they'll get us right on the spot. Hi guys. So. Let's assume this is an actual plane down and there's people there. If everybody's fine, we can take them to Petersburg. If somebody needs medical attention, we'll probably have to take them to Juno. Is there anything that uh, you think we should be thinking about there, Dave? Yeah, just triaging, uh, how many people can fit in here. We got two litters, so seven people. Yeah, let's hope for the best. Anytime you hear seven people, then you start thinking for a mass casualty. Extra medical gear, extra litters and backboards. Downed aircraft, you start thinking about wreckage, and fire hazards, and maybe some tools to be able to cut through some of that wreckage. Are you picking anything up on 406 yet, sir? Negative. I'm gonna start my descent. I've got the area in sight to where we're heading. Cabin doors open. Cabin doors open. Cabin doors open locked. I can't see that side over there, Jim. That's the only thing at all. I can see there's this, this first ridge and the second ridge behind it. As we flew across Frederick Sound, I could see the weather system in the valley. Essentially, the whole east side of the sound was consumed in fog. This was kind of disconcerting because, uh, you know, we're going to have to go in there to start looking. So the problem is, is as we crossed the shoreline, the ceiling started to drop. We uh, essentially came into about a 200-foot hover, which put us about 20 feet over the trees. And we slowly, incrementally crept up the valley. Kind of a critical maneuver in the aircraft. Not a great flight regime to be in. Uh, but it was we needed to get to that position to uh, to locate the beacon and hopefully the crash site. Freaking out being in the door flying around the mountains like this. All right, we're going to creep through here real quick. We're looking for broken trees, anything that would be a telltale sign of, you know. All right, we've uh, started to get uh, a DF on 121.5. Roger, but the uh, area is just closed in with fog, so we can't get there yet. We had been on scene about 40 minutes uh, before we can get it, our first plane pass through the valley. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very disheartening to know that you have a position, you can't fly to it because of weather. You know that there's people out there that need your help, but we also have to worry about the safety of the aircraft and the air crew because if we end up in the trees, we can't help anybody. So we, didn't make, we needed to make smart decisions, get in there safely to be able to affect the rescue. We're pretty much over the spot. We are right there. Yeah, the 406 is over here. The first step is obviously finding the crash, which sometimes can be the most difficult due to the, uh, the weather here. The fog was so thick, we were nearly 500 feet from their position, and we couldn't even see the mountain. All we could see was fog. It's frustrating. The woods is really thick, and the weather is not cooperating. And you know people are down there, and they're in distress, and seconds count. Got him in sight. Got him, sir. Control. Got him, sir. Got him, sir. Back control. Hey, Dave, will you call sector tell we located him? I can tell you advised we have located uh, a person down here. We launched on a downed aircraft with seven people on board. Once we saw him, we started talking about hoisting right away. It was going to be a max height hoist, and the terrain was very rugged, lots of trees. It was on a mountainside. It was going to be a difficult hoist, for sure. All right, Dave, let's get you ready. Roger that, sir. It's hard to tell what that slope's doing, Dave. It's pretty steep. Mr. Gibson said that he spotted someone. It's a huge lift off us, knowing that we found them, they were there, and we can now do our job. Mr. Anderson decided that we want to do a hunter's deployment of the rescue swimmers of the land. The biggest problem with that was that our hoisting area was maybe about, I'd say, five feet by five feet, and we're doing a hoist from around 200 feet. Dave, you feel good staring up that hill if we put you right between those two logs? Yeah, that's not too steep. Sure. I feel good doing that. All right, anything happens, guys, we're going in the creek bed right there. That's where I'm putting it. Roger. Dan, where did they freaking crash at? I wonder if it's up. Dude, it's, I think it's, you see right out your door? Right to the right of it, there's something on the ground. They must have just closed it in. Yeah, I can't even see. 
When we decided to hoist, we didn't have a visual of the actual plane crash. We just had one survivor on the ground. And so uh, the plan was to lower me down with the EMT kit and make contact with the survivor. And then I was going to radio back the situation to the helicopter from there. Sir, it's coming over now. Send cabin door for low check. Low check, swimmer. Low check, please, sir, it's going down. Sir, it's below the aircraft. Sir, it's going down. As I was getting lowered down, the sheer height of the hoist was uh, kind of in the back of my mind, and I knew I'd be getting lowered down through some trees, but I had full confidence in Newkirk. He, we worked together a lot. I was just ready to get down there and help him out as soon as possible. Make sure you don't come down or anything. We're about 10 feet from a tree below us. Yeah, Roger. Can you come easy right, sir? Yep. Sure, it's on deck. Once I got on the ground, it looked completely different from the air. It was much more treacherous than I had saw. There was a lot of uh, debris, uh, big down trees, and, and it was a lot steeper and muddier than, than we had anticipated. I knew it was going to take all my physical and mental abilities to make it through this circus. Do you have a clear on a tree there? You're clear above it. Don't descend at all. 6038 swimmer, uh, make contact with, uh, with this gentleman. It is confirmed one person is dead. There are other people who can walk. And I'm going to go with him to the crash site. Over. And uh, roger that. Once you get to the uh, crash site, give us an uh, update on who is ambulatory and who's not. I made my way to the survivor. I asked him what was the condition of the other survivors. And he told me that there was one person that he thought was dead. And there was one person with a back injury and a possible broken leg. Another person with a possible broken back another person with a broken wrist and a possible broken back and uh, three other people all had cuts and bruises and were in some pain. They had been there for over five hours. The aircraft was wedged in between two trees with both wings ripped off about eight feet off the ground. The burning smell is what what really got to me and, and what made the situation even more dire. Okay, I have one litter rigged and ready. Now let's get the other one. Right off the bat, I assembled one of the litters and I hoisted that litter down as quickly as I could. Came back into the cabin, I reconfigured the cabin again, assembled a second litter and sent that litter down. God, it was a bad decision to do my shoulder workout yesterday. They hoisted down the litter to me for the uh, first survivor, which was the female with the back injury and the broken leg. I had to explain to her that it was going to be very painful for me to pick her up and put her in this litter. She was really brave and I picked her up and got her strapped up in the litter. There was debris flying everywhere from the trees and getting thrown around from the ground. I felt bad for her because she was getting debris thrown on her, so was I. But her best chance of survival was, was rapid extraction. There's coming inside the cabin. There's the basket really quickly. So what we came up with was that we were going to litter the broken leg patient and then basket the broken arm patient, get those folks back to Petersburg, get them to the ambulance while Dave packaged up the back injury. We formulated that plan and then uh, we would go back to Petersburg and come back and pick up the remaining survivors and, and Dave. Oh man, this is going to be the hard part. All right. Just get halfway out right now. Right here, okay? Oh man, this is gonna be the hard part. Alright, that's it! halfway out right now. Right here, okay? The SAR alarm went off and there was an airplane crash down by Petersburg. The second survivor was had a broken wrist. He was the son of the lady I always sit in the litter. I had to crawl outside the door a little bit so he couldn't fall out of the aircraft and then pick him up because he had a broken wrist and he couldn't lift his weight. Yeah, and move them over to the seat. She is in a lot of pain, sir. And I just need to get up in a seat and then we're ready for it, like, okay? We talked to Dave at that point and said, hey, we're going to leave you here and so you can package your second survivor and we're going to take him back to Petersburg. Is her approach? Is her approach, sir? Give it. Okay. Yeah, Petersburg truck, construction helicopter, short, final runway to three. 
Petersburg was probably about an eight minute transit from the crash site. It was ideal for uh, a rescue operation like this where you need to make multiple trips. We were able to get on deck and there was EMS personnel already pre-staged and waiting. We were able to offload the two patients relatively quickly to get back out on scene. All right, you got enough room back there for four more survivors of Dave? I really uh, hope so, sir. All right, good copy. We're just arriving on scene now, so uh, it'll be a bare hook recovery of the basket. And we can do it all as one evolution, if yeah. you're okay with that, And sir. that's the brief. If there's no questions, that's the brief complete. Roger, that's the checklist complete. Ready for multiple basket recoveries from the unknown altitude. We started doing baskets. I did two, uh, two basket hoists of two survivors. That went fine. Baskets coming inside the cabin. Basket inside the cabin, moving the survivor. And then on the third basket hoist, uh, when I had the basket about 20 feet off the deck, we caught a burble. Yeah, I'm starting to get a little bit of an oscillation in the basket, so I'm trying to stop the swing so it doesn't hit that tree. <laughs> basket just hit the trees, last out of the trees. I went up, swinging really bad, sir. That turbulence is messing everything up. That basket's coming up. He's doing a really good job just sitting there, though. I had to use both hands to control the cable to get it to stop swinging. And the guy in the basket uh, actually hit the trees twice, and I was able to get him up in the cabin. This guy's got a puke when he gets in here. Bring a basket up to the cabin door. Nice job, Mark. Moving the basket. First three baskets went well. Now Mark had to do the daunting task of making enough room in the cabin with three survivors already in there to get the seven-foot litter in the back of the helicopter. And litter's clear of the deck. Easy right, sir? Very easy right. And hold. The final victim had a, a back injury that we did not know how severe it was. Litters inherently don't ride well when they, they are hoisted, much less when they're hoisted at about 180 feet of cable. I don't know how this kid has a smile on his face, but he does. This one's going to take me a little longer to bring it inside sir, because he's got a back injury. You got it, buddy. And bring the litter inside the cabin. Oh, shit, all this mud. I have, like, no traction. Take your time. Roger. So we got the last litter into the cabin, and I uh, sent down the bear hook to pick up Dave, and uh, he hooked up. Got him up to the cabin, and he's uh, turned facing me. He's just covered with mud. He's got mud all over his face, all over his dry suit. Okay, he's coming inside the cabin. Uh, and yeah. the cabin door's closing. We are ready for forward flight. How's it going, buddy? Good to go. A little wet, but uh, going good. Once I make it in the helicopter, I immediately go into reassessing the patients. They were all shivering uncontrollably. They're all soaking wet. And so hypothermia was a major concern. Breaking out blankets and keeping their spirits up. Victor, you know. Once we landed and we did the patient transfer to the local EMS, it was a huge feeling of relief. It was a great feeling to be able to go and help those people. I had given everything I had. Missions like these, they're in an extreme circumstance, but the individuals in the Coast Guard are of the highest quality. Makes me really proud too be a member here. This particular case just goes to show that anytime the alarm goes off, you never know what's going to happen. Aside from the one man who died, you know, we were able to locate the survivors, provide medical care, and extract them out within probably less than six hours from their crash, which uh, here in Southeast Alaska is nothing short of a miracle. There are moments and events and people that God uses as powerful signs of hope. My name is uh, the Reverend Frank Allen. I'm an Episcopal priest or minister. Some of you know that the Allen family went on a once in a lifetime vacation in June. We booked a cruise, the five of us, on a National Geographic ship to tour part of Alaska. We had casually signed up for a float plane excursion. 10 minutes into the flight, to the glacier, the plane took a hard turn left 
and stalled. And we crashed into a pair of gigantic trees and then dropped 20 feet straight down. About three hours into the crash, you're hoping that someone is going to save you, but then when you hear the sound and you can see the helicopter, then you have this sense that we're going to get out of this. And that was a great feeling. That was a tremendous feeling to know that, that there was an organization that was taking care of people who, you know, just by happenstance are lost in the wilderness after a plane crash. I have a regret that I didn't stop and shake everyone's hand. I don't know if I'll ever see these men again or be able to thank them for saving my family and saving me uh, from what you know could have been death. It's a great gift, that's all I thought of.